Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Nathan Hamill. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining me this morning. So uh, last night, I was a very good boy. I drank plenty of water. I came back to the room very early, did all the right things, and I still couldn't go to sleep. So that just shows you in Las Vegas that no good deed goes unpunished. I should have stayed up all night. So thank you for joining me this morning for uh, From Hackathon to Hacked. My name is Nathan Hamill. I am Senior Director of Research at Kidelsky Security. We are a global security company. I lead the fundamental and applied research team as well as the new product prototyping team. Uh, I've spoken at many conferences before. I've been a Black Hat Review Board member for well over a decade, and I'm the current uh, track lead for the AI machine learning and data science track. So given that, you might wonder, how does a nice boy like me end up talking about Web3? And that's a bit of an interesting journey. So about four and a half years ago, I joined Kedelsky Security, and about half of my team was cryptographers. And we were working on things, advanced cryptography, like threshold cryptography and zero-knowledge proofs, and a lot of this was being funded by blockchain companies. So what we did was we stood up a practice helping blockchain companies secure their software. And that's kind of where I got involved with this topic. You might wonder what Web3 even is. Does everybody in here know what Web3 is, or were you coming here to uh, learn? How many people know what Web3 is? OK, quite a few people. So it's the proposed next version of the internet, if you listen to advocates. And really, for the sake of this uh, talk, what we're going to be discussing is that um, applications running on top of blockchain technologies. So that's really the focus of this talk. And you may wonder, since this tends to be a contentious topic, you may wonder what my perspective is before listening to anything I have to say. And let me be clear that I am very neutral anytime technology is involved. I do not feel the world is a better place with vulnerable technology out there. So I feel as security professionals, it's our job to help people innovate as securely as possible. So I have a few goals for this presentation. The first one is to kind of take the previous four and a half years of working with these projects and kind of distill down into some points to help you understand, given all of the news that you may see, why these problems persist. And any time you hear a talk about like, like this at a security conference, it always turns into smart contracts. But as you'll see as we move along, that's only one piece of a larger puzzle. I hope to cover some contributing factors and talk about and try to get security people more involved because we've been kind of sitting on the fence around this topic. And I'll make a few recommendations towards the end about how we can start to make this area more robust. So anytime an emerging technology comes along, it thinks it's the exception. Doesn't matter what the emerging technology is. It claims to be exceptional. So we can't do that anymore because this technology is so new that we have to throw out the playbook and write a new one. And we know from history that that's just not the case. So emerging technologies usually involve a bunch of traditional technology experience combined with something new. And what we're really doing is trading a set of known issues and complexities for a set of unknown issues and complexities. And as we're figuring out those unknown issues and complexities, that's really where things start to uh, merge around security. So hopefully you'll start to see this kind of tied together. Um, if you look at the news on this topic, you've probably noticed things like, you know, billions of dollars in illicit transactions, for example, or, you know, $2.2 .2 billion stolen from DeFi. And these are 2021's numbers, by the way. It's still very bad today. Uh, will be worse in 2020. And if you notice this week that there was a cryptocurrency mixer uh, that got sanctioned by the US government because a lot of these illicit transactions often end up going through a mixer for anonymization. And the community is kind of upset about that um, for several reasons. So I understand the need for a certain amount of anonymity in the space. 
So I understand why Three Watermelons Guy wants to be Three Watermelons Guy and not a real name. Everybody is acting as their own bank. If you know who Three Watermelons Guy is, then you can visit Three Watermelons Guy's house. Uh, and if you know he has a certain amount of cryptocurrency, you may be able to force him to turn it over. But what I don't understand is why Three Watermelons Guy took money during the Nomad Bridge exploit. And that's really a problem that the community is going to have to come to grips with. Otherwise, they're going to see more and more regulation. This year, we saw a top 10 cryptocurrency tumble, a project that many people thought was going to be the next big thing. We started seeing more traditional attacks affecting the Web3 space. So maybe you've heard about projects' discords being hacked, or there was an issue with customer.io who you know, was compromised, and attackers were able to send notifications to uh, project's customers. These things are going to become more and more common as this space increases in popularity. And I mean, it's not like you don't know where people who collect cryptocurrency and NFTs hang out. If somebody collects cryptocurrencies and NFTs, they really want you to know that they collect them. So they're kind of creating themselves as their own targets. And here's another thing. Everyone is acting as their own bank. That's not just people, that's the projects. And that's what leads to such a high impact when these things get hacked. If I had to summarize the entire situation you know, we're seeing in a single sentence and why it's so bad, I would say we have inexperienced developers writing new financial products on emerging platforms in full public view where the cost of failure is incredibly high and exploitation effort and time is incredibly low. That is a perfect storm of factors all coming together. That means it's not just inexperience. It's not just being irresponsible. It's something else. If it were just one of those, we may not see things so bad. But we have high value targets with public exposure and an unexplored attack surface. So we haven't found all of the issues in the space yet. We're still finding them. And this means that simple mistakes can have immediate and devastating consequences. And if you're a Web3 developer and you launch a successful project, one of the first lessons you learn is that Gone in 60 Seconds isn't just a terrible Nicolas Cage movie, it's also what happens to all of your money. Because the time to exploit this stuff is incredibly fast, and it's something we're not used to seeing. We're used to a more traditional attacker approach where there's you know, some, some reconnaissance, and there's some exploration, some exploitation, and pivoting, and owning different systems. But some of these are so exposed, you can literally call a function and get money. This means that Web3 projects don't have the luxury of failing gracefully. If you're going to lose all of your money, <laughs> then you're going to have a bad time. I don't think anybody would have any, any uh, argument there. So now I want to get to the point where I'm trying to convince you know, security professionals about why they should care about this space. Because you might say, well, that's all well and good. You know, crypto bros are going to do crypto bro stuff, and I'm just going to go over here and do my thing. So the world is not a better place when vulnerable technology is out there. Because we tend to find that this technology gets adopted in strange places we didn't expect. And it puts us behind the curve. There's also some legitimately cool technology. I mentioned threshold cryptography and zero-knowledge proofs. These are being funded in large part by blockchain companies. And these have a useful impact on regular business. If you're monetarily driven and you're into bug bounties, I can't think of a better space to be in because we had a $10 million bug bounty paid out followed by a $9 million, or a, sorry, a $6 million bug bounty. I mean, that's a pretty impressive amount of money for finding a bug. And of course, nation states are getting into the game as well. So the Lazarus group was attributed to the uh, Ronin, Ronin network attack, which was the largest crypto hack in history. And I have a little bit of a, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But that means that this vulnerable technology could be fueling the nuclear ambitions of a nation state. 
And of course, one of the number one points is that this space cannot be successful without security. There is a fundamental coupling between safety and security. We haven't really seen that. I mean, if you, if you look at, if you attended, how many people attended the first day keynote? Okay, quite a few. If you heard Chris Krebs say that vulnerable software is more valuable than secure software because the developers don't feel an impact after it's compromised, this space does. This is a use case where you cannot be successful without security. And I know, I've been in this community for 20 years, and I know there's one thing we love, and that is to hate. We love to hate, it's in our bones. I remember walking around conferences, there is no cloud, only someone else's computer. Uh, and I would wonder how many of those people are now cloud security professionals. We tend to be behind the curve. And we also don't realize that this new technology often forces us to come up with new protection mechanisms that we may not have came up with otherwise. So if you think of like IoT and secure elements, you know, all of these things forced us to step up our game and it had an effect far beyond the domain that it was in. If you are a security professional, there's really only two things you should hate. And that is people who hate specific technologies and PHP, everybody can hate PHP, is definitely okay. And I know what you're thinking. I had to mention NFTs, and you're like, yeah, I got you. But even NFTs, I think people, it's not, people don't hate NFTs, people hate people who collect NFTs, which is like, uh, hate the player, not the game type of a thing. Um, but I, I would even have you take a step back on NFTs. Because what we're really seeing in this space is something we're not used to. We are seeing technology experiments play out in full public view. And this isn't something we're used to. You know, we are used to innovation happening in stealth mode and private test users and decades of development and marketing slicks with wild claims and quantum teleportation and all the other things that happen with traditional innovation. So before we get into this, before we start diving into this, keep an open mind. Because this is something new, it's challenging, and it will really force ourselves to move forward. As a security professional, if you're interested in getting into the space, one of the first things you have to do is define the delta. So what is the delta between all of the experience we know and have as a community, and what we need to know for this space? And hopefully as we move along, you will see quite a bit of uh, delta filling with knowledge you already have. So Web3 architecture. If you've ever tried to develop a Web3 application, um, you may have went through a hello world and you saw something relatively straightforward. You basically built an application, you deployed it on the chain, utopia happened, world peace followed, and everybody was fine. That only works if you don't need Let's see, what don't you need? Uh, if you need data, that would be bad. If you need scale, that would also be bad. If you needed speed, that would also be bad. You know, three things that developers often don't care about. Then you get into something that looks a lot more complicated. So you end up having to use an API, a wallet, and of course, you know, traditional storage is for mere mortals, so you have to use IPFS or Airweave or something like that. And of course, if the chain is too slow, then you have to build another chain on top of a chain so that you can chain everything together. Each of these components creates a new attack surface, something else that you need to think about and protect. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but one unique thing about the Web3 space that's a little different than some of the other emerging technologies that have come along, like you know, AI, for instance, is this space is really trying to recreate everything. And we didn't really see that with AI. We tried to solve new problems with AI. We tried to solve traditional problems with AI. But we really didn't tokenize it and try to throw it all over the world and all this other stuff. So they're really trying to reinvent a lot of things. And some of these components are, can be incredibly vulnerable and incredibly costly. So this is a massive and complex space. Once again, a lot of times when you hear talks on this subject, it's about Ethereum. There's more than one blockchain. So we really have hundreds of blockchains, and if you think about the attack surface and how it works, 
Every chain you can kind of think about as being its own operating system, and every smart contract language is its own framework. Not all of the knowledge translates even across chains, which can make it hard to ramp up because you have to be hyper-focused. The other thing to keep in mind is that each of these smart contract languages and chains have quirks. Well, quirks is a bit of an understatement uh, because if you initialize something with the wrong value, it'll default to true, and then everybody gets money except for you. So these are the things that you need to account for when you're threat modeling, when you're testing. And, of course, blockchains are extremely limited. They don't know about each other. So they don't know each other exists. They don't know the world exists either, which creates quite a few problems. So, for example, Ethereum doesn't know that Solana exists. And Bitcoin doesn't know that Terra exists. Sorry, it doesn't anymore. Uh, too soon? Okay, sorry. Um, so all of these things are things that developers want to get around. So what these spaces have allowed is loopholes, right? So developers create workarounds for these, things like oracles and cross-chain bridges and side chains. And uh, so this is Rect. How many people have ever been on Rect before? Okay, very good. Rect maintains a leaderboard of the top hacks, basically. And what I've done, oh yeah, okay, so that was last week. Slot that in at number five. So these are cross-chain bridges and side chains. Ways of breaking out of one blockchain to another. And it accounts for most of the value lost during these hacks. If you think about core blockchain technologies, it's, pretty, it's been pretty resilient. You know, we haven't had a lot of you know, core blockchain problems with security. It's always the apps running on top, and it's many times involving apps that are trying to bridge tokens from one to another. And for attackers, it starts with the end. So an attack needs to start at the end because you need to figure out your exit strategy. Because if you just hack something and move it to a wallet and keep it there and don't move it and then figure out what to do with it later, there's a larger possibility that somebody is going to be able to find out who that is and possibly even recover some of the tokens. So what you see, I mean, in, it's the, the other thing that happens too is it's not like you can just hack something and then call, call up Apple and say, hey, can I get 100 million in iTunes gift cards? That doesn't work either. So what, what uh, groups that are money laundering do is they try to confuse analysis. So a lot of times there'll be a hack that happens, it'll hit a cross-chain bridge, it'll go to another chain like Ethereum, then it will go to some DeFi projects, then they'll put some in a mixer which anonymizes the transactions and then it's gone. So the exit strategy starts first. So let's look at a few attacks and I chose a couple of these attacks to kind of highlight very simple to very complex. And uh, another benefit is that all of these attacks happened this year, uh, and two of them last week. Um, so you can tell how, how uh, late I was putting my presentation together. But a bonus to you, you get uh, very new information. So let's look at Nomad Bridge. This was the one that I dropped in uh, at number five on Rect. Uh, this is a cross-chain bridge. So like I said, you know, Blockchains don't talk with each other. So you may have value, you may have tokens on one network and want to use them to buy something on another or invest in some protocol on another chain. So cross-chain bridges allow that to happen. And the issue here was that there was, an, there was a value that was initialized to zero which bypassed you know, all, of the, all of the messages or all of the authorization on the messages and people were able to drain the tokens. And basically, what was interesting here is that you need, didn't need to know anything about the attack. You didn't need to know any solidity, you didn't need to know make any calls. All you had to do was capture a successful transaction, replace the wallet address, and broadcast it on the network, and you got money too. Probably the, the lowest bar for an attack. So there were people exploiting this that didn't even know how the attack works. Uh, so, Another interesting fact here is it means that it wasn't a single person attacking it. It was like a bunch of, I guess, Web3 piranhas that just were taking little bites until there was no money left. Uh, also, if you remember our pal 3 Watermelons guy, 
Um, he claimed to be a white hat af after the fact and said, FBI, don't chase me down. I'm going to give the money back. Uh, so maybe he did that from the first part, or maybe his team won and he flipped over a cop car and uh, you know, now he's regretting it. Regardless, he says he's given the money back. This is probably going to be incredibly hard to read, but um, if you can read that, it says private key in mnemonic, and you can see the values sitting there. So anybody here familiar with how cryptocurrency wallets work? So you know what happens when you, with the mnemonic, you can reinstantiate the wallet. So last week, um, there was a bunch of people who were having their wallets drained and they couldn't figure out why. It was Slope Wallet, which is a, a non-custodial cryptocurrency wallet, which means you're managing it yourself. What happened was there was, uh, the mobile application had verbose logging enabled. The developer wanted to learn more about the users, and that's just what you do. You crank the logging up to 1,000 and collect every bit of information and send it to a third-party cloud service. Well, all of the private keys and all of the mnemonics were going to this cloud service. So that meant all of the wallets were vulnerable to compromise. And the reason this was interesting is because it's kind of like a Web 2 issue affecting Web 3, which shows that, hey, you need to get everything right. It was a misconfiguration. And the, it, another interesting theme that you'll see is that the team didn't notice. So you're collecting all of this verbose information, and you don't look at it. Because anybody who looked at that would know, oh, wow, that's bad. That probably should never happen ever. Uh, the Ronin network is another good example because I think this is where attacks are headed. So the Ronin network uh, used in Ethereum, so, so is anybody familiar with Axie Infinity? Okay, so uh, very high level. Axie Infinity is a video game. It's a play to earn video game. And it's a place where people who collect NFTs can go to have their NFTs battle it out with each other rather than battling people on the internet. So basically, you could play to earn they had to use their own side chain uh, to, for performance reasons. And what ended up happening was that there was nine validators. If you can control a majority of the validators, then you can control the transactions. Four of those validators were run by Sky Mavis, the, the organization that was building the video game. And in true, uh, <laughs> if you're familiar with the Lazarus Group and their techniques, in true Lazarus Group fashion, it started with a phishing attack. So they identified a developer, made him a lucrative job offer. He went through job interviews. And of course, what do you do? You send him a, uh, an offer letter. Well, the offer letter had a nice little surprise in it, like the Lazarus Group likes to do. And next thing you know, $624 million was gone from, from the Ronin network. Uh, it was attributed to a nation state. I, how, would you, how would you like to feel to be that guy? like uh, completely terrible. Uh, the reason I say that this is the, f that I think this is the future where some of this stuff is going is because it's not like the Lazarus Group didn't start with the smart contracts. <laughs> they probably didn't find anything and then they went back to their old tricks. And if you're familiar with the Bank of Bangladesh attack that they had, which before was the largest banking attack against the SWIFT system, it took them a year. They had to plant things on the network and hope that nobody updated things and wiped out their attack. So this is combining multiple attacks, chaining multiple attacks together to compromise one of these projects. Another one of these is Beanstalk. Um, I think the Verge article kind of uh, summed it up well. It says, cryptocurrency project robbed after hacker votes to send himself $182 million. So one of the things that's being um, uh, experimented with in this space is this concept of community governance. So if you've ever heard of a DAO. But basically, it means that the project votes on what to do with things. And basically, an attacker was able to manipulate the governance protocol through a flash loan, which is a, you know, uh, a loan that you can take out that you have to pay, by the, pay back by the end of the transaction. So they were able to buy themselves a majority share and vote to send themselves all the money. They used an emergency protocol and that made it, had a 24-hour hold on it, and nobody noticed, and he ended up getting the money. So interesting here, use of a flash loan, which is a legitimate thing for collecting money from arbitrage into attacks. 
It's also interesting because normally, you know, you hear of like 51% attack, and, but this is a way to get billions of dollars relatively easily. So there are some themes here. Uh, so known security issues in code, poor architecture and design. You know, all of these things are common with traditional software. And of course, almost back to traditional software is culture, organization, experience, and process and operations. So you might wonder, given all of these attacks and given the devastating consequences, why is this not being addressed? So let's start off with culture because everything starts off with culture. These are not enterprises many times. They do not look like enterprises. They don't have security people. They don't have security staff. And it really falls on a spectrum. So it could just be a project of two people, or it could be something like a centralized exchange. So a centralized exchange has governance. They have to, regulatory compliance. They look a lot more like a traditional project. Regardless of size, you will be attacked by a nation state. So it's important to keep in mind, you may not be dealing with a company. It may be a small project of a couple people. And they are experimenting with a lot of different technologies. And each of these technologies has its own attack surface and its own things to be accounted for, like flash loans, for instance. That's something new. Like, uh, there's no analog for that, like, walking, like taking out a loan from a bank and saying, walking up to the teller, she hands you $10,000, you take it, you hand it back, and you pay her $10,100. Like, that just doesn't exist in real life. But if you don't know what one is, then you don't know how to threat model it when you're threat modeling a protocol. Now it's time for the, the dirty word, so you might want to plug your ears. That's decentralization. So decentralization is one of the things that may slightly frustrate you in this space. And that's because it's often referred to as you know, um, a lack of ownership, which is a, it's a feature and a drawback. And if you think about it, on one hand, it's nice because things are community owned, you own your own stuff. But on the flip side, decentralization also means an attack of accounting for problems. It means nobody owns the issues either. So these projects are meant to be community owned many times. But what you find is when you start doing a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, and you start voting on things, you realize it's not necessarily as fair as it seems. So usually people with more money have more say, and sometimes those people say things that you don't like, like, hey, I vote to liquidate this project and take all the money. Uh, and that's a legitimate vote, right? That's not even an attack. That's like part of the design. And so these DAOs often control money. But I think the important thing to think about here to, t to take away to talk about some of these projects is you cannot solve tactical problems with a DAO. It cannot be up to the community about whether to patch a piece of vulnerable software. So a good lesson learned that we learned in the traditional space that applies here is that the community will not solve your project's issues. We haven't seen it in any other community. It won't, it won't do it here. Some other cultural issues that plague security here is um, if you have never dealt with the Web3 uh, project, this will be surprising to you, like the purposeful not wanting to make code upgradable. Deploy once, never touch it. And that's meant to build trust, right, with the community. The, the huge downside here is that we haven't even found all the security issues yet. Like, this security is an active area of research. So if they have code that is not able to be updated, then there's no way to protect the, the project. The other things here are putting in um, safeguards into the contract that will you know, allow people or allow yourself some protection, like not allowing people to drain all the funds at once or putting rate limiting in the contract. Uh, you also see things like radical transparency. So uh, it's not uncommon to go by a project's GitHub page and see security issues in their public bug tracker. So, I mean, hey, if somebody reports an issue and you can never update it, uh, that's bad. Or if somebody's able to exploit the issue before you have a chance to fix it, that's also bad. Um, you know, and there's also another mentality that people should be able to write vulnerable code because that's like some sort of Web3 Darwinism. All of this makes your project less secure. And to quote Dr. Ian Malcolm, 
Nature finds a way, and so do attackers. It's not like nation states only have one technique, and if that technique doesn't work, they move on to somebody else. That's just not how it works. They're not called advanced simplistic threats. So we need to make sure that projects understand they need to cover a lot of ground, otherwise they can just wave their money goodbye. Inexperience is, a, is probably the one that you're the most familiar with, um, the most noticeable attributes. Inexperience and irresponsibility often look very similar from the outside. So sometimes if somebody's inexperienced, it often looks like they're acting irresponsibly. And what I've found is that many project developers are very new to, the, to development in general. They just don't know certain things exist. But one of the things you'll never hear after somebody wins a hackathon is, yay, we got funded, now it's time to look at security. Maturity has a direct impact on security and privacy and safety. So these projects aren't doing the most basic things, like asking what happens when something goes wrong, which is something we all ask. I mean, it's even part of threat modeling, you know, what happens when this stops working? So they have no plan when something, they have no way of preventing things going wrong. They think they're including security, but quite often, you know, they use a security audit as some sort of proof that they've done everything well. Security it begins and ends at a security audit. You know, they may need an audit for funding, they may need an audit to prove to the community that it's safe. But the problem here is that we've had people, and we've done audits for these projects, and then they, get, they have a security issue, and then they say, well, that should have been founded, but it wasn't even in the code we were looking at. Like, it wasn't part of the code. We had one, one project that we found a very severe issue. We reported it to them. They're like, oh, that's bad. We're not using that code, so we're going to remove it. Everything's fine. A month later, they're like, oh, yeah, we were using that. They put it back in, and that happens. So that shows you no matter how many audits you do, you will not be safe and if you don't have processes that follow along. You have to get everything right the first time. There are no guardrails like traditional developers may have. So that means all the on-chain code, all of your communication, third-party components, the design of your protocols and logic. So some of the quote-unquote hacks that you hear about aren't exploits of the smart contract functions per se. It's a hack on the design of the protocol that made it vulnerable. And that's something that's a little new in our space. So you have to know what can go wrong and how to protect it. And of course, as we all know from the traditional space, a lesson that hasn't been learned is that an audit will not solve all of these issues. Security can't come at the end. So from a process and standards perspective, there really are none. So we've had uh, developers put equality operators in the wrong direction. I mean, if you think about building a financial product, you think that you'd want the equality operators in the right direction. There's been projects that have paid out way too much money to participants and then had to beg them for all the money back. So it's not a good place to be in. If they had a simple QA process where more than one person looked at the code, they may have at least found the simple issues. There's no formal you know, security bug reporting. All of these other things are missing that we're used to seeing in the space. And that's because they're just not learning from adjacent technologies. They're not learning from dev, the things that we've done in DevSecOps. They're not learning from threat modeling. They're not learning from any of this stuff. And I mentioned monitoring before. So another thing that's not happening, th this is a public blockchain. You can see all of the transactions, but none of these projects are really monitoring anything that's happening with their project. So the Ronin validators attack, the largest attack that happened, that was six days after that, they noticed that all their money was gone. And it wasn't even them. It was a member of the community Imagine a member of your community walking up, oh yeah, you don't have any money left, why am I dealing with you? That's just not a great place to be. Another thing that's super important in this space is, it ha is having some way of collecting intelligence. We're in a new space with new exploits, new attack techniques. If you are not taking, if you are not learning lessons from adjacent projects, if you run a wallet and somebody else's wallet gets compromised, it's probably a good idea to say, hey, could that happen to us? What happened there? Now, one of the great things about being open is that a lot of these projects, even after they get hacked and lose everything, they'll do a write-up on it and say exactly what happened. And most of them are pretty honest, uh, which is actually pretty refreshing. So there is ways of learning from other failures to work into your space. 
because, you know, crying is not the best incident response strategy. But if you haven't uh, built protections into your system, if you haven't allowed your code to be upgradable, it may be the only strategy you have. So I'm pretty hopeful about this space. I mean, we know more now than we did a few years ago. There's much more information out there. So if you're interested in learning and getting into the space, there's more and more resources than ever today. So I feel like this is starting to become more of an attainable space. And one of the things I always try to tell projects is that security is a team sport. You know, nobody goes out and hires a security savant and they come in and, you know, fix all the problems. You know, you can't even count on the best security firm on the planet to protect you by doing an audit if everybody else in the process isn't doing the right things. So I hope that we can start making it harder for attackers rather than incredibly easy. And that should be the goal. So as security professionals, filling the delta is first and foremost. So I mentioned not being able to upgrade code and all this other stuff. There are other controls that you can use to get the same amount of trust. If you don't understand how the project works and the APIs and chain-specific pr protections that you can use, then you wouldn't know to make those recommendations. There are plenty of vulnerability write-ups, CTFs, bug bounty programs, all of these are, you know, all of these are available to you that you can start learning more about. VCs and foundations who usually fund these projects um, need to step it up because just asking for an audit is not solving the problem. So asking for security specific guidance, some sort of response, a monitoring strategy, you know, all of these things need to be accounted for. So if you win a hackathon, you should have to put a, a plan in place about how you're going to address these issues before it launches. Core chains, so that would be, you know, Ethereum, Solana, Algorand, all these core chains have some responsibility too. Providing security documentation and guidance um, is something first and foremost. Funding more research but if we think about how we solve some of the traditional or more traditional security problems with code, they should be looking for ways to instrument protections at compile time. So be that through a dedicated framework or be that through native code to catch those things. So you shouldn't be allowed to make painfully obvious security issues. Now that won't solve the problem. A lot of these are protocol specific, but it's a start, it's something. Uh, they should invest in continued research and, of course, uh, publish reference architectures. So if you're building an AMM or you're building a cross-chain bridge, they should publish what a reference architecture looks like. And projects need to learn this lesson, is that there's no magical innovation coming along that will save you. If there is, they should tell us about it because we've been waiting for decades for some magical innovation to come along to solve all these security problems. It's going to be hard work for projects, more than anything else, more than any other group, projects have it the worst. Security can't wait until the end. You know, they need to hire some dedicated security staff. You can't count on security companies to solve all these problems. Beg, borrow, steal, hire somebody out of college. You know, you've got nothing today, right? Somebody who has passion and who's willing to learn and who you're willing to sit with, I think it's a great area for people because you start to learn about application security, you start to learn about deployments, you start to learn about all these things. We need to have them learn from DevSecOps. You know, there are ways to scan code you know, as, you, you know, as you check it into your repository. Threat modeling is probably the number one thing that they need to do. You can't design a protocol without threat modeling it, and yet many projects do. Static analysis is also something you can do. Not all of these projects are written in Ethereum, so um, some of it's Rust. We have Rust tools. You can use things like SEMGREP at Kedelsky Security. We have a SEMGREP rule set uh, specifically for Solana that we can run on, on these tools. And these are, these are things that can be developed either by the security community, by the you know, project communities. And of course, you know, practice defensive coding. 
have these protections built in to the project. Don't allow everybody to drain your or drain your wallet, all your funds. Don't allow projects to be able to do things very quickly if that's not part of the use case. For projects, also have a QA process to make sure those equality operators are in the right spot. Things like uh, functional testing, you know, that things that you can use and run at runtime or before deployment, I should say. Another interesting thing is tagging sensitive areas of code so that if a change happens in that area, you know to give it way more scrutiny. So that's something that can be done and managed uh, through the source code. And of course, build a monitoring strategy with some sort of approach. You know, don't, uh, don't just cry, because um, that's not a great strategy. So I have some extra information here uh, that will be available in the, uh, be available in the slide deck. And I'm sorry for shotgunning like a ton of information at you because I'm sure that's what it felt like. It was way too much for 40 minutes. I wish I had um, three more hours and a bunch of discussions. That would be great. But uh, I am around if you have any questions. And thank you for joining me today.